This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, writer-director Todd Robinson, has enjoyed an eclectic career in film, television, and documentaries. Todd has earned a Primetime Emmy and National Board of Review Awards, among others. Some of his films include The Four Diamonds, White Squall, Lonely Hearts, and Phantom. Todd has served as supervising producer on the hit CBS show Chicago PD. His current film, The Last Full Measure, opens across the country on October 25, 2019, starring Sebastian Stan, Jeremy Irvine, Christopher Plummer, Bradley Whitford, Diane Ladd, William Hurt, Amy Madigan, Ed Harris, the late Peter Fonda, John Savage, and Samuel L. Jackson. Todd is on the board of Save a Warrior, a veteran-led suicide prevention retreat. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. Interestingly, Todd received a BFA in theater from the conservatory at Adelphi University, where his roommate was the late Jonathan Larson, Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award-winning author and composer of Rent, and Tick, Tick, Boom. For those reasons, and so many more, it's a truly great honor for me to have as my guest on StoryBeat today, Todd Robinson. Todd, welcome to the show. After hearing all that, I feel like I've earned (laughs) retirement. (laughs) You and me both. (laughs) So where did all this come from? Where did you, early in your life, say, I want to be in the entertainment industry, I want to be in theater and make movies? Well, I think it probably really is rooted in um, some form of childhood trauma. <laughs> isn't, isn't it always? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it it, uh, it probably has to do with um, being bullied at a, at a young age, really, and uh, and not having the ability to be heard, uh, and so I overcompensated by <laughs> by 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 needing to be heard by millions and millions of people. I see. So, um, <laughs> have, have you had the, uh, the opportunity to get back at the bullies with this? You know, I don't look at it that way. I, I look at it, you know, we're all complicit in the, in the things that happen to us. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I, again, you know, you can look at these things and hold grudges and, and things like that. Or as in my case, uh, I've done decades of, of therapy, not not because my life was entirely dysfunctional, although as artists, I, I think there's a level of that to all of us. We're trying to work things out, but it, it's also fuel for our art. And so uh, I'm not entirely interested, uh, you know, in being cured, uh, you know, quote unquote. I'm doing air quotes, but I I think it, uh, it it's important as storytellers to understand what it is that fuels what we're trying to do and what sure. we're trying to say. I, th- I think if you ever do cure yourself, you'll stop being an artist. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I, th- I think you know, all the all the great artists are something not quite what we would think of as ordinary. Um, and so I think that's great that you you know you continue to dig in on that. Um, I, I, on the other hand, just keep bumpering around. <laughs> Um, so, all right, wh- where did you get your training aside from Adelphi? I mean, you went to Adelphi and you, you did theater. Did you do a lot of theater? Yeah, I was going to be an actor. I mean, I, I and now I look back on that and I, I, I don't even know who that guy was. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, at the time, I, I think I was more, a little more, more narcissistically positioned. Um, th- there was something about that interaction between an audience and the performers on stage, which, you know, is something that uh, is, 
you, you don't get that experience in cinema generally. No. Um, and and that was a beautiful thing because it was spontaneous. That uh, that thing that happens each night that has to be earned. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet experienced uh, in a cooperative way. Uh, that that's the the glory of theater. I think you never. There's an element of never really knowing what's going to happen from night to night, from moment to moment, uh, and that that was exciting to me. I think. And, and so, you, but how, how did you get away from it? What what brought you to movies and TV? Um, pain, suffering. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, a need I, for money, huh? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I guess you know I was always broke, but. Um, it was really what happened to me was really um i suppose it felt coincidental at the time but when i was in new york i i met a, a buddy who is still a dear friend of mine who was trying to be a writer and i had always had that sylvester stallone you know fairy tale in my head right. if i wrote something and put myself in it that would be the thing that you know lit the fuse sure and so I had this idea that revolved around a historical character, and this guy was trying to be a playwright, and I thought, well, why don't we pool our, our efforts and uh, create a one-man show that maybe I could do? Mm. And uh, so he started to write this thing, and we collaborated, and I, I realized that, I was, that there was something satisfying about that process. I didn't know what I was doing, by the way. I was just trying to generate a piece of material to showcase myself with that's the, i think that's that never the be- really that's the best way to do anywhere it. um yeah. and uh but the story fascinated me and i it was always with me and so years later i ended up uh, i was doing a play in los angeles and the woman who was the producer invited me out for coffee just a casual coffee after a performance i think and we got to chatting and i i started to tell her the story and I didn't realize it at the time, but I guess I was pitching. And she said to me, that's pretty good. You should write that down. Mm. And I immediately resisted that. I said, wait, wait, wait. I'm not a writer. I, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I can't spell. And that would be a disaster. And she said, no, no, no. I can help you with that. And so she encouraged me to write, which was an amazing thing to be encouraged. Because as an actor, especially in New York, I felt like, you know, I was attacked most of the time or I was sitting in a room with a bunch of guys who were taller than me, better looking than me, <laughs> all of that. I felt pretty, you know, pretty beat up. You were being bullied and, again. Pardon me? You were being bullied again. Yeah, ma- yeah, there you go. There, that, well done, sir. Um, and so and so uh, I, I went away and I sat down and she um, got me a, a K-Pro computer. Now, a K-Pro computer was the original um, uh, laptop computer, yes. except it looked like a cinder block. Right. I mean, you could carry it, but... <laughs> I know exactly what it was. was. I used K-Pro. Did you ever see one of these? Oh, like I... a little, uh, like a four-inch <laughs> monochrome screen, I'm, screen on it. And I'm, the, I'm old enough the, to have used one. All right. You know, <laughs> the keyboard kind of fell off of it, like, you know. <laughs> and so, anyway... This thing had this marvelous thing called a floppy drive. Yes. And in those days, floppy disks were actually floppy. Yes. They were bendable. Yes. And one of them was this amazing thing called a spell check. Mm. And that, the, the intervention of that changed my life because it eliminated the shame that I had carried with me my whole life about my handwriting and all of those things. So the moment that I sat down in front of that screen, my life was transformed. Wow. Because I realized, unlike acting, where you're constantly waiting for permission to do your art, I could sit down and write every single day and nobody could stop me. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about writing is if you have a propensity for it, uh, is that you can get better at it. And I was really teed up. I'd read all the great plays. I understood the actor's problems. Um, I, I was never going to get caught writing the emotion. I was going to put it in between the ink mm. and the blank parts of the page. Those things sure. came to me relatively um, effortless, effortlessly. And so um, I wrote this thing down. She continued to help me. And I got it uh, 
in front of a guy who was an old Vietnam combat photographer, cinematographer guy, kind of a one-man show, a guy named Frank Dobbs. And Frank had written for like shows like Gunsmoke back in the day. He was probably 25 years older than me. And we went to a place called Lincoln, New Mexico, where this all took place. It was really the story of the Lincoln County War and William Bonney, uh, a.k.a. Billy the Kid. Yeah. And as I'm walking down the street, my wife calls out to this guy. Now, this is a town of like 40 people. It's very <laughs> tiny, very remote, even to this day, in central, south central New Mexico. And there's this good-looking dude walking across the street with long hair and a beard, and she calls out to this guy, John, and he turns around and he says, Liz, and they strike up this conversation. And it's a guy named John Fusco, <laughs> who was, uh, uh, even at that point, uh, a wonderful and successful screenwriter yeah. who had written Crossroads and uh, uh, Havar, uh, what's the horse one? Havar. Oh, Hidalgo. Hidalgo, thank you. H Hidalgo, yeah. Uh, and and many others, a wonderful writer. And he, I, she said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm writing this story on the Lincoln County War. And this is, was my first, one of my first great lessons in screenwriting, which was I thought that I had discovered, owned, and entirely occupied the story <laughs> of the Lincoln County War as Billy the Kid. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and, and this is what's called in the public domain. Yes. And I was shattered. I was completely shattered. But she put me together with Frank Dobbs. I aligned myself with John. He was making Young Guns at the time. And I was invited to that set. And then I ended up interviewing. I turned my project into a documentary. Interviewed Emilio and all the guys that were in that movie, John and the director and so forth. Right. And my film became a study of how a, an historical character had traveled through popular culture through, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 movies at that point. And that became the thesis of the film, and it became very successful. Disney bought it, and that was really my beginning into filmmaking. And the bonus was that I got to marry the girl. <laughs> that, that worked out well. It worked out well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's been correcting my spelling ever since. Well, I, I got into once I got into computers and stopped using a typewriter, I was in heaven, because you you used to have to go back to you know you wanted to change something on page two after you wrote a hundred page script, you'd have to go back and figure out how to insert a page or white out or whatever. It was a pain in the butt. The gold standard was the IBM Selectric. Yes. With that little button that would go back. Yes. And white out you didn't have to paint it in it would just go bink yeah that was like who, who knew and then the computer came along and and changed everything it all became obsolete yes indeed so who then be, were your filmmaking heroes who did you look up to as you were trying to figure this out well you know that, that's a good question I, I i mean i think in the beginning it was the, the movies that i had grown up with and my dad, there was always a joke in my house. My dad was always trying to make me sit down and watch classic movies. And it became a joke in our family. You know, when he wanted to, us to watch a movie, you know, we'd always say, is it a classic? You know. <laughs> but it turns out that those movies um, that he forced me to watch ranged everything from uh, early Sergio Leone movies, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood movies, Spaghetti Westerns. Right which um, to this day I absolutely adore and love, um, a, a, partly because they were so guerrilla in their nature. Um, you know, classics like um, Casablanca and, the, you know, the golden age of movies and, and so forth. And then my decade of movies that probably influenced me the most were the 1970s. And so for me, it, it was, uh, you know, Scorsese, Francis Coppola, Steven Spielberg, um, and then later, you know, I, I fell in love with people like Bennett Miller, you know, mm -hmm. who, who is uh, probably a little younger than me, but someone who I think has a, just a tremendous command over not only um, uh, storytelling, but commercial storytelling. Um, so, um, but I'll tell you, there, there was a moment uh, of epiphany that I had, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, 
it, it was uh, it stands out in in my mind in my life. I was in Colorado Springs doing summer stock, and we were working seven days a week, and we we were mounting shows while we were performing them. We were you know rehearsing shows. Where it was repertory, and we got a day off. And I was just I was twenty years old or something, and I was also the choreographer. I I was trained as a dancer as well, huh. and I. Um, I, I said, I'm just going to go to the movies. And they had this little teeny movie theater, and there was a double bill, and I didn't even know what the movies were. Um, but one of the movies was called Days of Heaven, right. and the other movie was called The Duelist. <laughs> and these were two of the most cinematically rich, gorgeous, stunning films I'd ever seen. And... Uh, and I, I, I just remember staggering out of the movie theater, um, transfixed, transformed, um, moved, and and saying to myself, I don't know what I just saw, but I need to, I need to be part of that. Mm. And uh, because they were just so um, incredibly impressionistic and cinematic and um, poetic, uh, and and the painting uh, that was done with light was just uh, overwhelming almost. Well, that was Nestor, anyway, Nestor Almendras, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and of course, Ridley Scott's first film. Yes. It was The Duelist. And so uh, little did I know that 10 years later, Ridley would be directing my first big film. That's amazing. And I, I didn't know how to go about it. I, I guess I thought maybe I would be an actor in a movie someday or, or something. But... It didn't occur to me that I would end up, you know, really being at the tip of the spear. Um, and it, it evolved naturally. But um, but that day, uh, I've never forgotten. And then years later, when I went to work with Ridley, the first thing I said to him was, tell me some stories about the duelist. You know, <laughs> tell me something, you know. And right. he said, oh, bloody hell. I says, I know where every bloody car and telephone booth and telephone pole is in that entire movie <laughs> and i took a beat and i said but there are no cars and telephone poles in that movie it's napoleonic france and yet this is a visual but he holds up his hands like he's framing a shot and then points his thumbs right to the outside of the frame and he says yeah they're right bloody there <laughs> and so what he was saying to me was that every he had to frame around everything to maintain the, the spell. And I never forgot that because later on, when I became a filmmaker, I realized that it's, it's so difficult to let go of what you know and what the experience of making the film was, as opposed to what a, a, an objective audience experiences. And so you have to learn to separate yourself from the trauma yes. <laughs> of making the film and everything that you didn't get or you know how you were you had this wonderful sequence designed and you get there on the day and you're you're just painted into a you know you're pigeonholed into something because of something you can't control and it it pollutes the the ex, your own experience of of the film for a long time until slowly like post traumatic stress <laughs> you manage it and it kind of goes away and you can start to see the film as a whole and it's very difficult when you make a movie or work on a stage show to um, to understand what it's like to have the first experience as an audience. But you, you lose that. Yeah, it's almost impossible. Yeah, it is impossible for sure. So, all right. So let's go through a bit of the process that you encounter when you're putting a story together in the first place. Um, when you're starting a new script, do you, where do you begin? Do you begin with characters or story? Where does it usually start for you? Well, it, it, it usually begins in silence. It begins in, um, in all these, you know, destructive questions. Can I ever do this again? Will I ever have a good idea? Mm -hmm. um, and, and all that sort of pointless, useless pressure. Um, but I've done it long enough that I know what my lane is. Um, and I, I, off, I get offered things, you know, often, um, but it's usually not great stuff. Right. It's usually, 
you know, journeyman, middle of the road stuff. So I've never actually directed anything that I haven't written because I've never, no one's ever handed me a script that I, I felt was any better than anything that I could do. And so uh, I get to a point where I say, does this need me? You know, is there something that I can do to make this worth doing for myself first and then for the people who were trying to get it done? And the answer is almost 100% no. So that brings me back to uh, desperation, loneliness, and isolation. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and um, But uh, what I do know is um, what I tend to write about, and I, I think that we're – you know, I think it was Ken Burns who recently said, you know, we're telling the same story over and over. Oh, you know, we're indeed. writing the same poem or the same song oh, over and over sure. again. And there are a few things that tend to emerge for me. I don't go seeking them. They seek me. And so when an idea or a story comes to me, um, I will become energized about it or engaged in it. And then as I start to do my process, um, bink, there it is. Mm. Oh, there it is. It's knocking. Okay, so what is that and process? And then it just sort of organically, you know, finds its way in. And then I usually know that I'm, you know, trying to peel the onion a different way mm -hmm. um, because I haven't um, completely resolved whatever the, this issue is that, that haunts me. Is, so all right. So you said that then you go through your process. Well, what is your process? What do you do? Um, well, it begins with the writing, and it begins with a series of Socratic questions that I ask myself. And um, I would say I would start by saying that writers read and writers write. And what we're doing right now, um, we're going to hang up and get off of this, and I'm going to not really remember much of what I said. Right. Because there's something that, that is just, um, and when, we're, when we speak, it goes into the ether and disappears. Uh, yeah. so you're capturing this so that it can be revisited. But generally, in conversation, you know, we bang our gums all the time, and I'm not sure how much we learn from ourselves. But there's something that happens between the brain and the fingers it doesn't happen between the brain and the mouth. And it may be that that the electro the electrical current has to go through your heart to get to your fingers. Mm. But as you write, um, things become more um, more um, permanent, more certain. And I forget that I, I forget that I write. I mean I remember sitting at my desk but, you know, hours will go by, and I'll have a couple of pages of um, what I call exercise work, where it's pretty much stream of consciousness. And then I'll go through it with a highlighter, and I'll start to highlight things that come up. And you'll see just sometimes it's just words, or sometimes it's phrasing, like fire, 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 heat, heat, heat. Mm. What is my unconscious telling me that I'm writing about? Mm. And that doesn't happen when you talk, when you blather about it. No. So, so uh, and, and I'm talking to you now about, about sitting down to write a screenplay. I'm not talking about the process of selling an idea. Right. Or I'm, I'm talking about actually executing a script. Yeah, that's what, that's what so we're like. That's what... Questions like, why do I want to write this? Who, who, and this is a big one, who, not what, is your story about? Sure. Stories aren't about what. They're about who. Mm -hmm. What is context? Who is what they're about? And if you start to write a... So if I ask you the question, who is your story about? And you say, Bob. And I say, well, where does Bob live? And you say, um, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, New York. Oh, okay. Start writing. Give me 20 pages on Bob. Well, that is a daunting task. But if you start writing about Bob, you get about two pages or two paragraphs into it, and you realize you don't know who the hell Bob is. Yeah, yeah. Because Bob doesn't exist. And what what ha tends to happen is you start writing about what you know, and what you know is about yourself. And the next thing you know, all kinds of personal anecdotes, moments that you haven't thought about in years and years start popping up, 
And those are original, unique things to you, which shall separate you from all others because they're unique to you. And suddenly all these kernels and, and, and wonderful little things start to emerge. Now, I do about 20 of these exercises. I usually am somewhere between 100 and 200 pages of, you know, single space, stream of consciousness writing before I begin, before oh. I begin structuring. That's a lot. And it's really, uh, in the beginning, I resisted it. I hated it. Um, I, I had a wonderful uh, mentor and teacher named Sally Merlin who ran the, the screenwriting program for many years at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And she taught me all this. And I realized if I wasn't willing to do that, the, the, the story or the idea probably wasn't worthy of, of me spending six months or a year of my life writing. So I would discard it. Um, but I tell you, if you do this work, by the time you write Fade In, you're not going to find yourself at page 40 or page 60 going, well, what do I do? Because you'll know. It, you'll, it'll all have been written. So that's what I do first. Um, and then I start to structure. And, you know, we've all read the screenwriting books. You know, they happen, there, there happens to be a, a certain... Um, structural element to screenwriting. Yep, definitely. Um, but these rules are also meant to be broken. If you don't believe me, go watch a Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> yes. Um, and they, they tend to work, right? I mean, you look at Pulp Fiction, it's all out of time. But there's, a, there's this thing, Steve, called that you've heard, of course, called The Hero's Journey. Yep. And I, I had been, you know, aware of it and, you know, structurally, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, beginning, middle, and end, set up conflict resolution. And then, uh, this is a weird segue, but uh, I, I went to work three or four years ago with a, with a charity that, that you mentioned in the, your introduction um, called Save a Warrior, right. which is a, uh, a, a suicide detox or a war detox for veterans by veterans. And the guy, Jake Clark, who runs it, invited me to come and watch it. And this guy's a military guy. He was in the FBI. He was, in the, he was a Secret Service agent. And he gets up there and starts talking to these veterans, and he puts this big chart up on the wall, and it's the hero's journey. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? what? How's he going to fold this into this? Hmm. And he says, this is three things. This is separation, refusal of the call, it's initiation, and it's return with treasure. Hmm. That's all it is. And within that, there is what we call nonlinear acceleration, epiphany. Um, within the unknown world, which is the second act of the movie, um, there, is no, uh, there is no linear time. Um, look at The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is in the real world. Um, she uh, it, it has a problem. There's a bad lady who wants to take her dog. What does she do? She runs away from home, and she meets a guy. And the guy's name is Professor Marvel. And Professor Marvel takes one look at her and goes, this kid's in trouble. And he's a bit of a shyster, and he cheats, and he looks at a picture in her little basket. And he, says, and he starts to, to set her up, and he says, what's this? A woman standing by a gate, holding her heart. Someone has hurt her very badly. And, and Dorothy goes, oh, that's my Aunt Em. I've got to get home. And she starts to run home, and he says, but I thought you were coming to me to see the world. And she says, no, I've got to go home just like Luke Skywalker says, I got to go home. Right. And so, and then they get there and there's an event in Luke's, you know, instance, his family's been murdered in Dorothy's uh, instance. She's been locked out of her family experience. They're in a storm cellar and this tornado comes. And when she wakes up, she wakes up in Oz where everything is upside down. And how do you know you're in Oz? It's in color. Oh, yeah, it changes. She's in the unknown world. This is a masterwork, by the way, that everybody should go back and look at. And it's the hero's journey, which is generally about men, and it's about a woman in this case. It's like the first uh, suffragette uh, movie, you know. I mean, it's, 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 it's an amazing thing. And, and then she goes through the unknown world where, where she doesn't know what's going to happen. Tin men talk, straw men talk, lions talk. 
Um, people lie, cheat, they're flying monkeys. All this stuff happens. And then she goes through the whole thing, and she's ready to leave, and the balloon leaves without her. And what do they say? What have you learned, Dorothy? Well, if I ever go looking for my heart's content, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Mm -hmm. If it isn't there, I never had it to lose to begin with. Is that right? That's all there is. And then she returns home. She wakes up in her bed, and all of those people who have played dual roles, right, it's her unconscious telling that story, um, they're all gathered around her, and she knows something that they don't know because she's been through this wonderful, transformative experience, and she's never going to be the same. And so that's what we're trying to achieve in, in movies, and I didn't learn that until I went to the suicide prevention cohort and had a military guy explain to me what I had been chasing my entire career. Really? And he applies it directly to us, because what he tells you is, listen, and, and Steve, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> this is like the great, you know, epiphany that was right in front of me the whole time which was the hero's journey isn't, isn't a template to go make a movie or write a book. It's a principle to apply to your life. Oh, sure it is. Right? Absolutely. So it, I'm a little dumb, right? <laughs> but every time you feel yourself resisting something, hey, you want to go to dinner tonight with the Smiths? Oh, Jesus. I don't want to go. <laughs> not, well, not really. You know? Well, you're resisting the call. Why are you resisting the call? You need to check that. Because, you, because you're anticipating that which you don't know, or you're projecting on that the thing that colored it the last time you did it. Mm -hmm. So now you go and you have dinner with the Smiths, and Mr. Smith offers you a job. You didn't even know that that was coming. I mean, who knows what it is? But, but every time now I find myself resisting anything, I go, oh, there it is, the unknown world. If I want non-linear non acceleration, if I want to learn, if I want to grow, if I want to come back with elder wisdom, then I best get my ass there. Yeah, I've been telling students for years that, that uh, your life is, is, follows all the exact plot points of any kind of good story. That you have a beginning, middle, and end. You, you reach various epiphanies, you go down various roads, you are challenged, you find obstacles and conflict, and you work your way through it. And life is very much, I think the reason why stories are told the way they're told and how we traditionally receive them and how we expect them to be uh, laid out is because it's really tracking the way life is lived for most people. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I, and, and there it is. Right, right in front of us. But what's beautiful about the campfire and the stories that we continue to tell, and this hasn't changed in thousands of years. Right. It, it just the way that we store the data maybe has. But Ar the stories Ar haven't really changed. Aristotle was the first one to sort of figure out the the method of it, if you want to call it that. That's right. That's right. And 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 we have the Socratic questions, you know, that that lead us you know, back into the form of these stories. And, um, and yes, they are keys to survival. They're keys to healing and growing, um, which is, you know, in, when we talk about the state of the art of, of filmmaking anyway, uh, it, it's so frustrating because it has been so homogenized and it, it, it has been so um, just uh, become a product of mass, massive corporations that, you know, where once the, the process of movie making was personal because people owned movie companies. Right. You know, the Warner Brothers owned Warner Brothers. They cared about what they did. And largely, the people from the Golden Age were immigrants who were coming back and going, what a place. Can, how do we reflect this back? You know, our and they were the all-American movies, right? The yep. Capra movies and yep. so forth. Sure. And yet... You know, today, all we get are these comic book movies where there's nothing at stake. You know, as much as I love Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man, you know Iron Man isn't going to die. Yeah, absolutely. You right. know everybody's coming back, so yeah. there are no real stakes. 
so um, I find myself um, a little bit, uh, you know, out of out of time or out of step um, with, you know, the things that they want to buy and put out there. And it, I, I hope that people grow tired of these things, and, and in some way we will return to more traditional storytelling that really opens up the landscape of the kinds of stories that can be told, because right now they're $200 million movies with $100 million marketing budgets. I think some of what you're talking about has appeared uh, on television and cable, on the cable channels, you know, on HBO, Showtime, and so on. We get some of those there where we they, they won't put them into a theater. I think what we've come to is a is a business, the entertainment industry that is trying to be risk free all the time, and that's not a good place to be, as you, as you and say. And predictable. And you know? predict, totally. I, I predictable. mean, no pain, no gain, no risk. I'll tell you. Last night I was in at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, mm-hmm. um, sitting in front of a packed theater, and th- this new movie that I have coming out, we can talk about. In more detail, Absolutely. but it's a uh, it's a true story about the efforts of um, of veterans of a really horrible battle to get um, a, an airman the Medal of Honor thirty two years after his death. He was killed in the battle saving them, and it, it it's a movie that really entirely transcends that story. That that story is, is sort of the, the 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 functioning engine of it, but really what it's about is the transformation of a young Washington bureaucrat who's forced to investigate it and is reluctant, re- refuses the call, and is transformed by these dogs of war. And, uh, and in the end, comes out an initiated man. And to see the... It, this is a movie for everybody, but to see the military community watch this film, and I've, I've screened it probably 30, for 30 of these audiences, they sit in the movie theater and quietly sob throughout the movie. It's very uplifting at the at the end, mm-hmm. but there are very poignant, touching moments in the movie. And you don't get that on Netflix. No. You know, I, I mean, I get crazy when people get up to go to the bathroom because I'm like, you're going to miss something that you're going to need to know. Don't get up. Hold your water. But that communal experience of, uh, and, and the contract that you – unconsciously right. I'm going to go sit in the dark with a bunch of strangers and potentially have an emotional experience among them is something that only happens in a movie theater or in a, in a, in a before a play. Right. No question. And, it's, and it's a remarkable thing. And we're casting it aside. Oh, it's definitely being transformed and, and it's not to our benefit. But that's where that's where the stories that you alluded to a moment ago are, are going. They're not going into the theaters anymore. They're going onto the onto the small screen. Um, that's right. And you might be able to sit there in bed with your earbuds in and watch it on your laptop, and that's all swell and everything. But you're isolating yourself from the common experience that happened in the Roman theaters. Absolutely I mean, true. There's a reason that we come together. It's called community. And, and we experience these stories together so that we can be transformed together, so that we can talk about them and re- re-examine them together. You can't do that if you isolate yourself in front of a TV, you know, the phone's ringing, you, put, you pause it, you walk out. I mean, to, to a filmmaker, to a storyteller, it's just so egregious that, that somebody won't commit 90 minutes or 106 minutes of their time to get what, in this case, I spent 20 years making. Right, sure. You know, if you're going to come, and I'll tell you something, if you pay for it and you go to the movie theater and you put your ass in the seat, you're probably going to sit through it. But if I put you in front of a Netflix movie, um, I can't start off slow. It can't be a slow burn. i got to, like, hook you now. And if I don't hook you now, you're going to change the channel. No question. And and that does not serve the, the public who have come you know, to see the film. I, I, complete, that. I completely agree. I mean, it, we are changing the dynamic of what that relationship is in uh, the arts. And um, and I, I, I hopefully you're right that we will get back the other way. But again, we're in this attempt to be risk-free in a movie theater for the studios. And um, 
it, what they get, you get the big popcorn movies, and that's about it. You know. Um, yeah, and you know, to to quote Spinal Tap, you know, the, those movies are all at eleven. They are all at eleven. <laughs> you know, I go in there, and I'm I'm a filmmaker. I've spent many, many, many hours mixing movies and editing movies and sitting in the dark. You know, and I go in there, and I'm just overwhelmed. Too loud. There's no dynamic range. Yeah, that's too loud. It just overwhelms you. Is correct. Well, so let's talk about what it's like to make a movie. Clearly, uh, the last full measure is about to come out, and you've got some extraordinary performers in it. T- talk to us a, a bit about what it's like to. We'll, we'll go back to what it what it is to put a movie together in a moment. But t- talk to us about what it's like when you have written this story, and now you have extraordinary performers like Ed Harris, like Samuel L. Jackson, like Christopher Plummer, Academy Award winners. What is that like for you? Well, how do you handle that? Well, you know, I try to get to know them on a personal level, and in in the end, we all have uh, commonality in what we're trying to do. I mean, it all starts with the with the um, material, and in the case of this story, because it's the war that it happens to be about is the Vietnam War. Um, you're dealing with a whole bunch of men who were of that age. Um, some who served, some who didn't. And so I knew going in that there would be um, an unconscious connection to that m- moment in their lives. Um, I mean, Sam was, a, was an anti-war activist. Um, he, you know, he, he, he was very active in... Um, in, um, in um, Protests? Uh, when, well, not just protests, but the civil rights movement mm-hmm. and, uh, and all kinds of things. Uh, Ed, too, um, William Hurt, you know, one of the pound for pound, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, and so they came with their own reasons to want to um, represent their own feelings about that war. And this is not, the, you know, people come in and they go, we thought this was going to be a war movie. And I always say, no, it's a love movie. Um, because it's really about how all these men care and feel about each other um, and how they've been uh, bonded in common experience. And that's what also happens when you make a movie. Um, you're up against, you know, d- difficult schedules, uh, lots of uh, fatigue, often uh, inclement weather. And, uh, you know, there, there are conditions that make it challenging to do these things. Mm-hmm. And because you travel that road together, you become close. And that's one of the reasons I think that I make movies because that um, that experience uh, is sort of a, a, a war experience. I mean, you're you're combating a thousand things, and to be able to travel that road with people like that uh, is is not only a privilege; it, it's an education. Um, but to answer your question, it starts off with the material. Uh, then it has to do with the filmmaker, in this case me, my passion for it, and my ability to describe for them what my vision is. Uh, Even though between you and me, I have a vision when it starts, but it rarely, I I can't even remember what I was thinking now, that it's over. (laughs) Because the the terms of life dictate, you know, what it will ultimately be. Is it on you? you write it in the editing room is it, anyway. Is, so. it on, is it on you, the, the filmmaker, to hook the actor? I'm not talking just, I'm not talking about just the reading of the script. I'm talking about beyond that. Uh, is it? Oh, the, yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, the, the first of all, you've got to generally go through this labyrinth of, uh, of, of uncommonly distasteful people. They're called <laughs> agent <laughs> managers. And I'm married to a manager, so forgive me. And I love my agent. But, uh, but you know, the, the ones that represent the talent, especially when you're dealing with big agencies, these are gangsters, <laughs> you know, trying to protect their clients um, and get them into the next Marvel movie. Because if I get my client into a Marvel movie, it could be 10, 10 movies, right? And, and you want to come with this independent movie? Like, no, go away. So you have to figure out first how to navigate that, and one of the ways is if you can get the damn agent to read the script and they're touched by it, 
maybe if you have an offer of money attached to that script, maybe they'll pass it on to the to the actor. Mm -hmm. But what I generally do is I find a way to circumvent all of that. Now, in the case of this movie, um, uh, ICM uh, read this movie for Sebastian Stan, and they have been working very hard to really turn him into a movie star. And they read this, and they, they saw instantly that this would be of great value to him. Now, he couldn't satisfy the financing. So they then understood that they needed to help me do what I wanted to do anyway, which was surround him with world-class talent. Of course. And so they extended to me um, many of the people on their list, Sam being one of them, uh, Bradley Whitford being one of them. Um, and so we started to you know, back load or front load the movie with all this talent. But those people you know, all had to sit down with me and had to you know, make sure I wasn't a nut and that I had a clear vision for this and that I had a process that would work for them. And so, yeah, you do have to persuade. We're in the persuasion business. You have to persuade them to come and join your circus. I would say, Todd, that we're, we're in the seduction business. Sure. You, you've persuade, got, seduce. Yep. You've got it. You've got yeah. it. In how you write your script has to be seductive. How you direct the actors, I assume, has got to be seductive in some way. Um, and ultimately, the, the finished product has to seduce an audience. I think we are in this. That's how I look at it, anyway. Is that we're yeah. we're seducers. Um, you know, you you put a. I guess he's now considered the most bankable um, actor in the world. That's being Sam Jackson, um, because he's got the largest box office total of anybody. Yeah, it's trivia. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I listen. The, the the reason that Sam is great is because Sam's great. I don't. It, it, I mean, that's just a little factoid that he likes to say. I mean, Sam also doesn't, you know, carry a lot of movies on his back entirely. No. But he's been in a lot of big movies, highly successful movies. Big movies. But that's not a mistake either. I mean, Sam is awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's you great. Know? He's an awesome person. He's exactly who you would think he would be. You know, he's uh, yeah, he's powerful. You know, you know, you're in the presence of somebody when you're with him. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he knows it too, doesn't he? Well, I think you get to a point where when you've been in front of the public and dealt with what we all deal with um, day in and day out, uh, you do build a certain uh, armor up and a certain um, level of confidence and, and so forth. But, you know, Sam, I believe, uh, if, if I have my stories right, his career didn't really happen um, until later in his life. I mean, I remember him in Goodfellas, for instance, um, and, and he's barely in that movie. So he was playing these smaller roles mm -hmm. um, until midlife. And then, you know, he caught up with himself, and the world needed somebody like him. And here he is. And, he, and the thing about Sam is he's immensely professional and respectful. He never leaves the set. He sits in his chair on set. He'll often have a book that he'll read. He comes. He has his lines. He never looks at sides. Uh, and he said to me, he goes, I, I've already done my work, and I have a point of view about this. And if you uh, need to course correct me, okay. But I've done a lot of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, that's far out. <laughs> You know, I, uh, great. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can just get out of your way then. How can, how can you ask and for so, more? I don't know. You know, he, he's just wonderful. All right, so let's go back to the, the process of putting a movie together. You've, mm -hmm. you've, you've gotten a point. You've written the script. You have people interested, like your agent and so on. Um, you've already attracted a certain amount of talent, and you finally get a green light, and you there's there's money backing it. What's your next step? What do you do to make the movie, um, to put the movie together as an actual production? What are your steps? Well, before we get there, oh. the way that you just distilled that, if only it were that easy. Well, yeah, I'm you know, truncating I mean, it, it down it to nothing. It literally took me 20 years to get this one made. Wow. You know, so what that involved was me going around with my partner, Sidney Sherman, pitching the movie 
to 50 different places and being rejected at every single one. Of course. Coming back and saying to myself, I still believe in this. I'm going to write it. Mm -hmm. I wrote half of it, was ready to give up on it. My agent read it, and she said, my God, you've got to finish this. What happens? So I got more encouragement. I went back. I finished the script. We sold it to New Line Cinema in a bidding war. They were bought by Warner Brothers. Big uh, 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 Matt Damon was attached. Uh, Shaker Kapoor was going to direct it. It was a big deal. Um, Warner Brothers buys uh, New Line and blows up their entire slate. So it goes into turnaround. And then I go off, start having a directing career, come back, get it set up, completely cast it with Morgan Freeman and all these other people. And I'm literally on set. I'm starting to, I mean, I'm uh, location scouting. I've got everybody ready to go. And money falls apart. Mm-hmm. I go off, make another movie. Anyway, it goes on like this for 20 years. Wow. And then finally, I, I was um, ready to, I, I, the money was coming back together. And the, I didn't know that this movie was going to get made until William Hurt showed up in Atlanta. Mm which was two days before we were going to shoot. So when you say it gets green lit, an independent movie never, never really gets green lit. It, it, you're chasing the money till the end. And I was in um, Atlanta on this iteration of the movie, um, location scouting, and I got a call from one of the producers who said, uh, I'm not going to say his name, but a gigantic actor who was attached to the movie, um, he is not, he's bowing out of the movie. And he had done this to me once before, and it collapsed financing. Oh. And I called my son, who was my assistant, and I said, get me on a plane now. Not tonight, not tomorrow. My bag is packed. I've called an Uber. I'm going to the airport. Get me on a plane. I'm done with this. I'm done. And that was my come-to-Jesus moment. I, I, I said, you know what? I've done everything I possibly can to try to serve the men that this movie's about, but I can't do it anymore. And it's funny that how all these things are connected. I came home um, pretty devastated. Um, Jay Clark from Save a Warrior calls me and says, hey, we're doing a cohort this weekend. Why don't you come and watch? And I went to watch, and he put me in the cohort. He made me do it with the veterans as a witness, I, I, I was sequestered for a week, and I came out entirely changed. I mean, completely transformed by the experience. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, February comes along, they call me back, and they say, hey, the money came back together, get on a plane. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> what, when you say, and then you get green lit, what do you do? Um, you're, you're managing all that agony and drama the whole time you're trying to be creative. And that is probably, you know, Clint Eastwood said the secret to directing is stamina, and he couldn't be more right. Because you are managing shit that you can't even imagine um, while you're trying to not alarm these huge actors that you're try- trying to create space for so that they can do Oscar-caliber work. But meanwhile, you know, your phone won't stop buzzing in your back pocket, and they're telling you, if you don't get to this meeting, this thing's going to blow up. And, you know, so to direct is not, is not only to direct, it's to direct under enormously adverse conditions. What's your, so, what's your secret for handling pressure like that? Would you have a secret? I do, actually. Thank you for asking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you have to remain poised. And what do you do to do and that? I meditate twice a day. Ah, there we go. TM. And the crazier things get, the calmer you have to become. Mm-hmm. But what happened to me was, you know, it's all about context. And we get a little crazy when we're making movies. And we get a little self-important. And at the end of the day, you know, I, this is what the cohort did for me. I went, you know, if this never happens, the only thing I have to manage is my own shame about not being effective enough. But you know what? I have a house. I have a wife. I have two healthy kids. Um, and I'm going to go back and continue my life. And I've never missed a meal. And 
there are a whole lot of people who, you know, in this world who were not blessed by being born into privilege and doing, getting to do the things that I've gotten to do. Right. So, dude, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to tell myself those things. And, uh, and, and then just, you know, be there for other people and try to serve them as opposed to serving myself. I, I, isn't that the, a, a miraculous and magical way to think? That, that, that if you're serving others instead of yourself, how things sort of work out? Service greater than self is the thing that keeps us from killing ourselves. Mm. It's the thing that gives life purpose. It's, it's the most important thing that you can know. And if you, if you ever, uh, uh, you know, are feeling down or feeling sorry for yourself or depressed, one of the best things you can do is go do something for somebody else. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jake always says, do two things a day. Do two things a day that you don't want to do just for practice. Mm. For other people, just just to remind yourself, it, it doesn't matter what is open a door for somebody, carry somebody's groceries, you know, w w take, you know, feed somebody's cat. It doesn't matter what it is, but just remind yourself that you know we're we're really here to serve other people, it, and by doing that, um, we get ours. It is a very hard we lesson serve to learn. Ourselves lo too. Yeah. But they got to get theirs first. Sure. It, it's, a, it's a hard lesson for most of us to learn. Uh, it took me forever to learn that lesson. That's a hard me lesson. Too. And, me too. And, and it, it is when you do that, when you start to look at, um, well, the world is just filled with people who have less greatness or, or glory or, or money or success than, than you do. And, and they're struggling in their own way. And everybody, even people who are filthy rich and very successful and famous, they struggle every day too. You know. That's right. And you you don't know when you meet someone. I mean, we 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 are great at projecting on other people. Um, yeah. You know, my I had a friend. My, my best friend from high school is a doctor, and um, he was doing an internship. Came to L.A. He was. 25 years ago, probably, and he looked around and he said to me, you know what, Los Angeles is the land of relative deprivation. And I went, <laughs> what? And I thought about that. I've never forgotten it. <laughs> but you, you look around yourself and you're surrounded with the illusion of tremendous wealth and who knows what. And we project ourselves. You see a guy, you can be driving a Porsche. A Ferrari's going to pass you. You're driving the Ferrari, a freaking Rolls Royce or whatever is going to pass you. It doesn't matter what you have. There's always something there to remind you that you are less than. And so if you invest yourself in, in these uh, talisman of success, um, you're never going to be satisfied. It's all about our interpersonal relationships. And that's why, you know, when you ask me, what is it like to work with these kind of actors? Mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, amazing artists and human beings, and the things that I remember are the conversations that we we had sitting in my living room, you know, pr you know, splitting the the creative atom or talking about politics or the social conditions of the world. You know, those are the things that I r remember, um, not, you know, that you know William Hurt has an Academy Award. I mean, right. he calls it the Golden Dildo anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, I was out there for 35 years, and um, uh, it, it, it does get under your skin in different ways, and you have to fight that uh, inclination to, to pretend that you're, you're better than other people because the, the, city, the, 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 the business and the city of Los Angeles sort of push you that way. Yeah, you know, I, I always think, you know, if you want to be in show business, if you want, like, this is really an actor thing, but I always, you know, because kids come up to me all the time, they want to be actors. And I say, do you want to be an actor or do you want to be a movie star? Because if you want to be a movie star, your chances of that are <laughs> infinitesimal. Tiny. There are so many things that would have to come together when you think of all the people in L.A. trying to do it, or, and in New York, and in Europe, wherever. It, the chances of you getting to the top of that pyramid are almost zero. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to be an actor, if you love acting, if you love that, that Socratic process, 
and you and and it, it will make you happy to be in an equity waiver play as I did for ten years and and get paid nothing, but have the hope that maybe someone would see you and and help elevate your career. But even if that doesn't happen, that you're loving the process of of putting up the play. And you don't mind being a waiter or, or doing whatever it is you need to do to s- satisfy your schedule so that you can continue to do those your auditions and all the things that are the life of the actor, right. then you should be an actor. Yeah. But if you're going to to rate it by your uh, what's on IMDb, you're going to be unsatisfied and probably sad, and it's going to get you. Uh, oh, for sure. I, I think that the business is best when you approach it as, I would do this for free no matter what, um, because you, you are compelled to do it. Um, and the, the, you know, it's nice to get the money, uh, but you, as an artist, you're going to go do it because you're an artist. And like you say, the people that are commercial-minded, uh, so they want to be a star, they're probably going to be very disappointed at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that's right. And by the way, artists do deserve to be paid. Oh, there's no question about that. I'm not saying they shouldn't get paid. I'm saying that that artists are willing to do it for free. I'm not saying they should do it for free. I, I get it. I, we're we're ali- in alignment in this. I just wanted to say it out loud. Yeah, I agree. So that I'm not being confused. I think that artists should be paid. I, I agree. Uh, and 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 paid, you know, a fair wage, um, myself included. But. That being said, I, I can't really change the, the state of you, things. You spent you spent 20 years not being paid, so you were willing to go at this thing for a really long time, you know. Or if you made a little bit of money, you made a little bit of seed money, but you weren't being paid to go direct the movie because the movie wasn't wasn't ready to go. So that's right. And you were willing to stick in there for a long time. Many people would have given up much earlier than than you ever did and you obviously didn't give up but uh um so i the, the business is predicated on people who must do it and not um are forced to do it you know that's right it's not ditched and, and and it is not a mistake that people who have longevity like sam jackson like ed harris like christopher Plummer, for god's sake oh my goodness it's not a mistake that they remain no no. There was something about their makeup, their DNA, their tenacity. Yes, luck is involved. You know, you, you, can't, you can't get up at the bat if you're not in the dugout. You know, all, the, uh, all of those cliches apply. But there comes a certain point where luck only gets you to bat. Now, can you put the bat on the ball? Well, That's up to you. Yeah, the, the, I've always said there are two pretty steep hills to climb the business. The second is steeper and harder than the first. The first is getting in and be, becoming someone that others you know, trust and want to work with. And then that second hill, which is much harder, is, is keeping it, is staying there. So, uh, you know, the, the, if you can do that, if you can make a career, as you have, you've made a career. It's, you're not a one-off. You didn't do one thing and you were done. No, you've had a career. Uh, and if you can do that, that's an accomplishment. That's a real achievement. Yeah, I think that's right. And and it, it circles back to, in, in terms of my uh, personal why, uh, it's the story. Um, I, I, I've had to have my own ego adjustments. And believe me, I've been, I, I've had plenty of humility thrown at me um, <laughs> daily, you know. Yeah. Um, but to me, the thing that gets me up every day is telling a story. Mm-hmm. It, it, again, it's service greater than self. It's serving the story. You know, this story has got to be told, and if I don't tell it, who the hell is going to tell it? i got to tell a story. And so I get up every day, and I fight the fight, and I've been doing it for 30-some years. Um, and and there, there is glory that comes with that once it's finished. But if, if people could see the scar tissue that's collected along the way, I mean, you might think better about about getting into this because uh, if you don't stick around um, and 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 have the tenacity to to do it, you and you give up in the middle. You know, you can't walk across the finish line if you run a marathon. You got to run the whole way. Mm-hmm. You, you know, absolutely. And, uh, I assume you can collapse I ass- on the other side, but don't stop. I assume uh, that you think of yourself primarily as a storyteller, not a director, not a writer per se, but as a storyteller. 
Um, I, I guess. I, I mean, I, I think of myself as a filmmaker, um, and and the the writing is the the first part of it. But a and in my dad was an architect. It's interesting. There are parallels. You know, he sat behind a big desk every day and drew lines, and those lines um, were only a plan. They were they were plans. They were a blueprint. Right. And if they if they weren't turned into a house, they were useless. And an unproduced screenplay is like that. Exactly. I sit there and I put words on a page, and so if it if it doesn't become something that I can show you, yeah, you can read it, but it's um, you know it's it's unexplored, it's undone, unless it's made. And so I have to make the film, which makes me a filmmaker. I'm not just a screenwriter selling screenplays. Mm-hmm. I mean, part of my life has been that, but uh, I would rather continue the social process of making the movie because I love both both things although I do love the quote Lillian Hellman who said I hate to write but I love to have written oh yes <laughs> oh yes uh, um, but you know uh, writing is a very uh, isolating um, or isolated experience but I love that I'm a caveman but then when it's finished I love to interact with 150 people mm-hmm. who are all trying to push a boulder up the same hill. The same hill. You know, the, the, the I think of the screenwriter as the architect and the producer as the general contractor, and then he hires all these other contractors and you this, all those various subs, and you, you go off and you make a, a building, but it's not a building, it's a movie or a TV uh-huh. show. That's, that's how I think of it anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, I use architecture as, a, as an exemplar in my screenwriting classes because I will, I will use it as an example of the difference between form and formula. A lot of people think that what, what we do is to create a formula, but it isn't. It's a, it's a form. There's a form that we follow in, the, in storytelling, and you can look at if you uh, look at the Eiffel Tower and you look at the Louvre and you look at the Guggenheim and you look at the White House and you look at your house, these are all things that we call buildings, and that's the general, you know, name of what all these things are but each one of them takes on a different has a different thing and they can be identified and they don't follow a formula but they have many things in common so that that's right that's a very interesting way to look at it um and form follows function right absolutely so um you know the the guggenheim museum is one thing and the louvre is another yeah absolutely. and they're also products of their their time um but all all have foundations, all have structural integrity in the walls, and they all need a roof. Right. And because what ultimately is their purpose? To display and protect art. Right. And, but, and they're public spaces. They all, they but all, they couldn't be, if you had a, a, you know, an alien come down and look at the two and say, what do these have in common? They, they don't look anything alike. No, but, they all, but ultimately you look at it, they've all got windows and doors and electricity and plumbing and all the rest of it. And, yep. and but it's all but each one is unique. Well, it's the same thing with movies until you get to certain TV shows where there is a formula that they follow. Oh, yeah. You know, so you get to uh, CSI or to Chicago PD and there's a certain formula that you follow. Um, mm. And and that's yeah, it's a Pez dispenser. I like a, to call it. <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Well, Todd, believe it or not, we've been talking for almost an hour and 10 minutes. Um, nope, I'll let you go. Uh, yeah, no, so I, I, I'm going to get our, to our last two questions, if we can. Um, sure. Which are, uh, in your vast experience, your 30-some-odd years of, of doing this, do you have any particular experience that you can share uh, that's oddball, offbeat, quirky, funny, weird, unusual, strange, something like that? Well, that I can tell. Uh, it's, a, it's a limited... <laughs> um, it's limited. <laughs> I, 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 I will tell you a story. Uh, I'll tell you a John Travolta story that, mm. that is, is more of a wisdom story than a, than a funny story, great, I guess. Great, great. Um, I was making a movie. It was actually my, my first feature directing effort. And uh, it was a movie called Lonely Hearts, and it was John Travolta, James Gandolfini, Laura Dern, Selma Hayek, and Jared Leto. Is that all? And others. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a great, great cast. And there was a scene, uh, it, it, because a lot these independent movies, there's always a scene that somehow falls out of the schedule and is chasing you. And you know that you have to get it. And in this case, it was a walk-and-talk scene on a street. And I had to 
and I was losing again. One of the big things about screen or, or uh, directing is scheduling, and you're always losing an actor. In our case, James Gandolfini was going back to his last season of uh, The Sopranos, and he had a hard out. So. Uh, I had to make a decision this one day. Do I drop everything I'm doing and run out onto the street to get this scene? It was a period movie, so it wasn't just an easy thing. And um, I run out, and so I, I make the c- commitment. We run outside, and it's John and Jimmy and, um, and Scott Kahn walking. They're detectives, and they're walking down the street. And, and they're just, they chit-chat. They say what they say. They get in a car, slam the door, and drive away. That's it. It's a big, long, steady cam shot, and and I'm and I get outside, and I'm I'm a little freaked because I got to get this, and there's a thunderstorm coming, and we're shooting in Florida, and if a thunderstorm gets within, I think it's 20 miles of you, lightning or thunder, they shut you down, mm. and so and it's coming, and I we can all see it on our telephones. And, um, and John was never late to set. He was always on time. And in this one case, he was late. So I got Jimmy and I got Scott, and I've got the sides. And I'm like, all right, guys, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to start here. We're going to walk. Let's walk. Come on. Come with me. Come with me. And I'm reading John's lines, and they're doing it. And then you get in the car, and they're, you're, you're out. And we rehearsed it a couple of times. And John finally shows up. And I'm like, uh, okay, John, here's what we're going to do. Just follow me. Follow me. This is what we're going to do. And I can hear the thunder coming. And look, just walk with me. Just walk with me. We're going to do this. You say this. He says that. You say this. You say it. You stop at the thing. You open the door. And you go, boom. And John's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay, we're going to go. And listen, we're going to roll on this rehearsal just so we get it. And we're going to go. Now, I had made a deal with John that, um, that I wouldn't shoot rehearsals. But in this case, I was, they were going to shut me down at any second. Right. So I'm like, okay, we're going, roll it, let's go. And off we go. And he gets halfway down the street, blows his lines. And it's a one right? It's, I, I'm, I, I, I don't have any way to cut away. So <laughs> they got to get their lines right. So I'm like, okay, cut it, back to one, boom, let's do it again. Do it again. He gets the same spot, dies. I'm like, okay, we're going to do it one more. And he takes me, and there were probably... 200 people standing around, fans, because where he shows up, lots of people show up. Of course. And uh, he pushes me into this vestibule, and he starts screaming at me, yelling at me, you know, and he's big, and I'm not. <clears throat> and he's <laughs> got his finger in my face, and he's like, you agreed that we would not shoot, you know, rehearsals, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just, like, standing there, and he's pissed. And uh, I just said, John, you have no idea what I'm up against today. And he says to me, takes a beat, takes a breath, and he goes, listen to me. I don't care what producer is up your ass. I don't care what's happening. What you have to remember is that what you and I do today is forever. And when this is over, if you put a bad take in the movie, Nobody's going to know about the thunderstorm or that producer over there or anything else. They're just going to blame you wow. and me. Wow. So let's get it right. And I went, wow. He's 100% right. Yeah. Wow. And then I go walking away with, with uh, James Gandolfini, and James whispers in my ear, he doesn't know his lines. <laughs> and I said, what? He goes, he doesn't know his lines. That's all that's going on. <laughs> he, he just needs he just needs to to do it a couple more times so that he can lock the lines down. That's all that's going. On. <laughs> I went, oh. but that was the punchline of the story. But the truth was that John was absolutely right. And at that point in his career, he's probably forty movies in. I was on number one, and um, so there was great wisdom in in the in my humiliation. I was getting yelled at in front of all these people, mm-hmm. but it was because I broke a covenant with him. And and he understood something that I couldn't possibly know. And I'll, I'll just put a bow on this by saying the greatest gift that a director can give to his actors is to create the conditions where they can do their best work. Mm-hmm. And what that means is casting a spell and creating a bubble where you can somehow make those lights and cameras and 
guys with tool belts on and all that go away long enough for them to be able to look into the eyes of the other actor and experience something unpredictable, unknown. And if you can't do that for them, then you're not doing your job. And in that moment, I wasn't doing that for him. I was, I was wrapped up in my own uh, anxiety about not getting this, this scene because in these movies, uh, when they're independent, like if you don't get it, they'll just say, "Well, you'll figure something out in the editing room." You know, I don't, I don't get. You know, this movie that I just finished was originally scheduled for sixty days. I did it in 25. Wow. In three countries. Wow. With combat. So, but I spent 20 years preparing for it. So, I was fully prepared to get what I needed to get. I didn't have to guess or I didn't have to go, we need to shoot that again. We need, I knew exactly what I needed to put the sequences together. Was it fun? No. <laughs> was I pissed that these guys wouldn't give me you know, the respect to let these actors have a couple of more takes so that they could explore it, yes. But in the end, I had to do what I had to do, and I had to pretend that everything was okay did it, did, well, so you, that they could do their work. You've now seen it in front of, what, 30 audiences or so? Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and has the reaction been fulfilling? Um, unbelievably moving. At the end of this thing... You know, we say, we we you know give them little posters and little keepsakes to take with them to remind them when the movie's opening. And last night, um, I would say there were 250 people lined up, and they wait for an hour to get to us to talk to us. Wow! Just because they want to tell us how much the film meant to them. And um, so in this case, yeah, it worked. But I have to tell you, Steve, when I was uh, you know, in the editing room and being just, you know, ravaged by producers. There's like 40 producers on this movie. Oh, boy. It's ridiculous. Um, but that's what it took to put the money together. But when these people put money into the movie, they feel that it buys them the right to have an opinion. Yeah. And so now I'm in the editing room. Now I'm fighting for every frame. So, you know, it's, it's, it's never just done. And now we're in the marketing phase of it, you know. Um, or are they going to spend the money in the right places so that the right people know about this movie so that it can get to the people who need to see it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's still an unknown. <laughs> well, you're... I know that when they come, they have a moving, powerful experience. And we, we track uh, our, our um, testing scores are around a 93 when... Um, m most the average Hollywood film is around a, a 55. Wow. So, so we know that if we can get them into the theater, they have a great experience. But can I get them into the theater? Yeah, that's going to be question. that's going to be the marketing part of it for sure. So, last yeah. quite last question for the day: um, Do you have a solid piece of advice or a, a tip for those who are trying to get into the industry, or maybe you're in a little bit and trying to get to that next level? Well, again, the one thing that everybody needs. In myself included, is we all need a good piece of material, a good script. Um, so if you can find a piece of IP, intellectual property, that someone else has written, if you can write yourself, as I said earlier, there is no, there's no one can stop you from writing. And you can get better at writing. Um, it, it doesn't mean because you write you will become a good writer, but if you have a propensity for it, um, get that piece of material, develop it, develop it yourself, or create a relationship with someone who is a writer and find your people. Um, you, you're, you teach at Point Park, is that correct? Correct. One of my very best friends went there. So as a young man, I visited Point Park. Oh. I love Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, the, when your uh, students get together and they're in those initial uh, boot camp classes, yeah. I always say to them, look around, because the people that are in this room are going to carry you for the rest of your, oh, your career. We, 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 Find they, your people now. They hear that from us every day. Well, it's, it's salient, powerful advice. Yeah, it sure is. Because those people, I mean, you know, my, my college roommate, as you mentioned, was Jonathan Larson, yeah. who wrote Rent. Right. And now uh, Tick, Tick, Boom is coming out. 
and uh, as, a, as a movie. And uh, yet we didn't know who we were when we started, um, but I don't think it's an accident that, that we pushed each other and pushed and pushed and pushed, and we were competitive, and all these dynamics were at play that ultimately formed us. And you find that in dorm rooms. You find that in college cafeterias. You find that in, in re on rehearsal stages. So find your people um, and never give up because never giving up doesn't guarantee success, but quitting guarantees failure. Absolutely and right. That's that, all I know. That is, that is um, you know, so much uh, great advice and wisdom throughout this whole show. Todd, it's been a great joy talking to you. I, I, I thank you so much for being with me today on Story Beat. Thank you, Steve. It's a privilege to talk to you. Please don't miss Todd's new movie, The Last Full Measure. It opens nationwide in the near future. Please check your local theater listings. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.